Yeah, thanks everyone for attending my talk on fine-tuning large, uh, large models on local hardware. And yeah, as you can see, the slides are online, so if you're interested, just follow the link or scan the QR code. And yeah, I want to start right away with a problem and not lose any time on anything else. So you probably all have heard about the recent developments that we had in machine learning and AI when it comes to big models. So for instance, uh, we've heard about ChatGPT, Gemini, Claude, for language modeling, or maybe you've heard about uh, image generation models like uh, DALI, Midjourney, and uh, Stable Diffusion. And now let's assume you have your own data and you want to train those models on your own data because they are maybe not good enough for the task at hand. And do you have any possibility to do that? And thankfully, yes, you have. So let's assume for this talk that we are interested in training a language model. And for instance, uh, Meta has released a couple of uh, models that we can freely use. So one of them is uh, Llama 3 8B. And I wanted to train that model on my PC locally. So I loaded the model through the Hugging Face Transformers library. And then I set up my optimizer. I loaded my data, set up my training loop. So this is fairly standard PyTorch code, which you have probably used yourself. And then I wanted to run this code, but I had an error. So who can tell me what's wrong? Anyone has an idea? Okay, so I can hardly see you, so I just come with a solution. The memory error is the one that we get if we run this code. So this is a very dreaded error, the bane of our existence. So if you have ever tried to train a big model with your local machine, you probably came across this error. And just in general, memory will be the bottleneck if you want to train large models. And therefore, it is a big problem that we want to tackle. So let's first explore why memory is such a big problem. So I checked the Llama 3 8B model, and I loaded it in uh, float 16 or bfloat 16 precision. And when I looked at the different modules that we have, we see that we have the embedding layer, which comes with 500 million parameters. We have the linear weights, so the linear layers have weights, but not biases, so that's seven billion parameters. And then we have the RMS norm, which we can mostly ignore. So overall, that comes down to eight billion parameters, so that's why it's called 8B. And if we look at the memory that we need, that is 14 gigabytes. So 14 gigabytes is quite a lot, but when I checked the packaging of my GPU, it said 24 gigabytes. So what's happening? Is NVIDIA lying to me? No, uh, it's a bit more difficult than that. So when we want to train such a model, we need actually to have a lot more GPU memory than that. So probably you know that if you want to train a neural net, you have to calculate the gradients for this model. And for each parameter, we need a gradient. So that means we need twice as much memory already just to have the gradients for this model. But this is not enough. So if we check back with the code earlier, we are using the AdMW optimizer, which is a fairly good optimizer. It's standard and works really well, but it has some drawbacks. So this optimizer has to keep track of the uh, optimizer states, which are the mean and variance of the updates of the parameters. So that means you have to add twice the size of the model again on top to the memory that we already require. So overall, that means we need four times the memory that we need to load the model to actually train it. So the, for the Llama 3 model, that means we are at 56 gigabytes of memory. So that is quite a lot, and that explains why I could not train it on my machine. And then on top of that, we also need more memory for stuff like the activations, which I haven't included here because they're fairly difficult to calculate but just know that we have to add even more memory on top if we want to train this model. Okay, so then I checked a few of the more popular models on the Hugging Face Hub and to see what can I train on my machine. 
And I came up with these numbers. So again, let's assume we load them in float six in precision. And then we have a couple of nice models from Meta, from Mistral, we have CREN models and the uh, Google Jammer models, which came out just last week, I think. And as you can see, they are all quite big. And the only one that I can reasonably train on my machine would be the 1.5B parameter model from CREN. And yeah, it's nice, but it might not be enough for my use case. So is there anything that we can do about this? Well, of course there is, otherwise I wouldn't be here. And the solution is called parameter efficient fine tuning. And um, yeah, I want to introduce to you one of the packages that we develop at Hugging Face, which is called Hugging Face PEFT. And this implements a lot of different methods that allow you to use parameter efficient fine tuning to decrease the memory that you need for training. Um, yeah, this is achieved by reducing the number of trainable parameters, and we will see what that means in a few seconds. And we also provide a bunch of convenience functions that you typically need if you want to work with these types of models. And there are also some misconceptions, so I want to clarify them right away. So for inference, there is no memory benefit. So this is purely for training. If you cannot fit the model into memory for inference, the path will not help you. Furthermore, uh, most papers show that full fine tuning is still the best when it comes to performance. So if you want to get the very best performance, you might want to invest into bigger GPUs, but we can get fairly close to these results. And finally, some people think that PEFT makes the training faster, and that's also not necessarily the case. So the goal is always to reduce memory, not to make it faster. But in practice, it can often be faster. So now let's check out one of these methods in detail. And this method is called LoRa, uh, which is short for low rank adapters. So why LoRa? Well, it's the most popular method out there, so I wanted to go into a bit of a, a more details here, but just know it's not the only one. Um, I've included the paper link if you're interested in the details, but I also want to give you a short high-level overview of what LoRa is doing. So let's assume we have a linear layer with a weight W, and this weight W is often quite big. So for our example, let's assume it has the size 1,000 times 1,000. So in normal fine tuning, we would update those 1 million weights. But if we are using LoRa, um, we are applying this LoRa adapter. That's how it's called. It's called, and that means we don't update W, but instead we update two smaller matrices, A and B. And these matrices have a low rank, so for instance, could be eight. So the A matrix would be eight times 1,000, and the B matrix would be 1,000 times eight in size. And if you add this up, you will see it's much lower number than 1,000 times 1,000. So when it comes to calculating the hidden states um, on the See the cursor, yeah. So on the top we have the linear layer, so that's just normal linear layer. We have um, w dot x plus b, so weight with a matrix multiplied by the inputs and then adding the bias. But if we have a lower layer, we change the equation a little bit. So we have w asterisk, which is just the same as w, but it's frozen. So it means we do not apply any updates to the base weights. And then we have this delta W, which is added on top. And this delta W is calculated by just multiplying B and A. And if you do the math, you can see it has the same shape as W, but it has a lower rank. And by the way, if you did not fully understand it, it's not necessary to follow the rest of the talk, but um, still wanted to give you a brief overview. Okay, so how does it look in code? So you don't have to change a lot of your code if you want to train a PEFT model. So you just load the basic model as you would always do. And then after installing PEFT, you can, install the, uh, you can import the LoRa config and the get PEFT model function. 
then you define the LoRa config instance, which takes a bunch of parameters. So R is the rank that we just saw, but you can uh, configure it much more to your liking. And then we call get path model by passing the base model and the config. And all the rest is exactly the same as you would always do. So you can re really easily add it to your training script and it should just work. So if you paid attention, you're now asking yourself probably, if we are adding more parameters to the model, how come that we need less memory? That doesn't make sense, does it? Well, let's revisit. So if you remember, three quarters of the memory that we needed was required for the gradients and the optimizer states, right? But these are only required for the trainable parameters. So the base rates are not trainable and we don't need to calculate gradients and optimizer states. And the lower rates are typically much, much fewer in numbers. So less than 1% of the total number of parameters. So that means we only have to calculate the gradients and the optimizer states for 1% of the parameters. So that means we need less memory to train the model despite having more parameters in total. And as a nice bonus, if you are finished with training, you only need to save the lower rates because the base weights of the model are already present. So you don't need to save them. The checkpoints are thus really, really small. You can easily share them, move them around and so on. So let's get back to our table that we had earlier about the memory requirements of the different models. And here in the middle column, we have the same uh, numbers that we had previously. And on the right, we have the numbers if we do LoRa fine tuning, and we assume a rank of 32. And as you can see, the memory that we need is much smaller. So it's roughly just a quarter of the memory that we needed initially. So for the LAMA3 model on the first row, we went down from 56 gigabytes to 15 gigabytes. So that is really a considerable improvement. And on my machine, I could probably train this model, even though I need a little bit of extra memory for the activations, I have nine gigabytes to spare. So that should work. Um, however, if you're using maybe a smaller GPU with 16 gigabytes, for instance, if you're using Google Colab T4 GPUs, which are free, they have 16 gigabytes, it will still not be enough. So can we do even better? And yes, there is a way, and that is if we combine path with quantization. So this is not a talk about quantization, but I wanted to give you a very brief overview of what we, we mean by that. So usually when we load a neural net, the weights are loaded in float 32. So that means uh, we have four bytes. We can also go down to float 16, then we have two bytes per parameter. However, if we load a model in with quantization, it means we are loading them in int eight or even int four precision. And there are a few other options, but those are the most common. So now we are down to one or even half a byte per parameter. So that means if we go from float 16 to int four, we have a four times reduction in memory. So that sounds pretty nice, right? Well, there's some disadvantage in that these models will have a bit of a degraded performance because we are making uh, approximations, right? So you have to factor this in, but it's not as bad as it might seem on the surface. But there's a bigger problem, and that is that we cannot train a quantized model. So the short summary of why that is, is we are loading this as integers, and thus, thus we cannot calculate the gradients for these weights, and without gradients, we cannot do training. So what can we do about that? Well, that's the nice thing about PEFT, right? So if we remember what we learned earlier, we don't have to update the base weights. They stay the same throughout the whole training process. And for the lower rates, what we can actually do is we can still load them in float 32 precision. And since there are so few of them, it doesn't really matter for the whole memory footprint that they are loaded in flow 32. It's still gonna be a very small model. So um, since the lower rates are loaded in flow 32, 
we can calculate the gradients, and thus we can train the lower rates. And this combination of methods is called uh, QLORA, so quantization plus LORA. And it has uh, proven to work quite well. Uh, so there's a paper that shows that um, the results are fairly good. So you can check that out later. Okay, so let's revisit this table again. So in the middle, we have the normal LoRa fine-tuning, and on the right side, we have the QLoRa fine-tuning, and we assume in four position here. And as you can see, we go down again in the amount of memory that we need by a factor of almost four to one. So the 15 gigabytes that we initially had to reserve for the Llama 3 8B now is just five gigabytes. So if you have a 16 gigabyte GPU or even a 12 gigabyte GPU, you can probably train Llama 3.8b on it when you're using QLoRa. So this is just quite amazing. And if we look at the other models, yeah, 70 billion models are still not really possible on your local GPU. So there we need some of the bigger machines. But let's look at the last row, which is a 27 billion parameter model, and we are now down to just 17 gigabytes, so there's a fairly good chance we could train it on the 24 gigabytes GPU. And by the way, these numbers I calculated with a script, and the script I have also uploaded to the repository. So if you wanna check out some models, how much memory they require with different parameters, you can just uh, visit the repo and run the script. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk about some of the other features that we have in PEFT. So one of our goals when we design this library is to make it very flexible. So that means we have a ton of different adapter methods and they all have their own strengths and weaknesses, of course. I don't have time to go over them, but just know that there's much more than just LoRa and depending on the type of problem you have, you should probably take a look at these other methods as well. Then we also make it very easy to choose which layer you want to target. So um, even if you're not using one of those very popular models, it should still work. And sometimes you might also have to fine tune, like fully fine tune some of the layers. So this is also possible with PEFT. Uh, then when it comes to LoRa, we offer a bunch of different layers that we support. So that should cover most of your bases we have half a, different, a half a dozen different quantization methods that we support. We have different initialization options which have some advantages in certain circumstances. And we have tried uh, distributed training to ensure that it also works. So you can use uh, DDP, DeepSpeed, FSDP. It's all working and we have a bunch of other features as well. And then I wanted to mention some of the advanced features that uh, I alluded to earlier. So if you have more than one adapter, so maybe you train three LoRa adapters for three different tasks, you can load all of them at the same time on the same model and also switch between those adapters. Often it can also be necessary to disable the adapters so that you can query the base model again. So that's also possible. And then one nice thing that we offer is that you can merge the lower rates into the base model. Why would you do that? Well, as you saw with the lower rates, we have to do a little bit of extra calculation when we do inference, right? So that means we are a little bit slower, not much slower, but a little bit. But if we merge them into the base rates, we get back the same speed. So if you just have a single lower adapter and you want to do inference only, you should merge it into the base rates. And then we have some other options like you get mix different adapters in the same batch when you're doing inference. You can, if you have multiple LoRa adapters, you can merge them into a single LoRa adapter, which can also be quite useful because it might have the capabilities of all of them combined. And um, we also have support for uh, Torch Compile for many of the features. So for, if you wanna do LoRa training, it should work with Torch Compile but some of the features are not supported. So if you follow the link, you can see what works and what doesn't. And then finally, I wanna give you a few tips if you wanna get started with uh, PEFT training. And in general, just know that 
all the knowledge that you already have about training neural nets is still valid, so there's not something completely different. So everything you know, you should just keep in mind. Um, but there are some special things you might consider when you're training a PEFT model. And first tip, which is more general, is start small and see whether that's already enough to solve your problem. And only if you see that the model is not capable of solving your task should you go to a bigger model. I think that's fairly obvious. And then, let's say you're using a large language model. First option should always be prompting. So maybe you can use some of the prompting techniques like chain of thought or a few short prompting and that is already enough to reach your goal. Then don't worry about using PEFT because training will always complicate things. But if you find that you want to use PEFT, I would recommend to start with LoRa first. Not because it's the best technique necessarily, but it's just the most popular. So you can find a lot of help online and it has a lot of features that the other methods might not have. But please also give the other methods a try once you have tested LoRa. Um, then it is important to do a very quick end-to-end -end run so for a full training and deployment if possible, because there can be some uh, pitfalls when you do this kind of training. So for instance, some users were using distributed training and then at the end, after three days of training, they found that the checkpoint is not working. So all this training time was wasted. Therefore, do a quick end-to-end -end run with just a small amount of data, see if everything works, and then you can do the full run. And then, Users often ask, like, what layers should I target? And typically, that should be just all linear layers. That works the best in most cases, so we have an extra option for that. And, yeah, if you find that your model is underfitting, try increasing the rank of the LoRa adapter. And if it's overfitting, you should decrease it. You can also apply dropout, of course, and uh, use other techniques that you already know. Then with LoRa, you typically can get away with a higher learning rate. So if you are f using full fine tuning and you found a certain learning rate works well, try 10 times that for LoRa fine tuning. And also, since you have more memory, you can maybe get a higher batch size and thus training will be a little bit quicker for you. And finally, I would recommend to take a look at the initialization options for the adapters, so especially if you're quantizing the model, as I mentioned earlier, we lose a little bit of precision because of that. But the LoRa adapters can actually offset that loss of, of precision if we initialize them correctly. So that's also an option which can help with quantized models. Yes, and that's it for my talk today. So thanks for your attention. Here again are the slides and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. I have a small presence for you as a thank you from uh, the organizers and all the volunteers and everyone here, I hope. Uh, we do have a time for some questions. Do we have any questions? Please make your way to the microphone. We have a question over here. Yeah, thanks for an excellent talk here. Um, just have a question related to quantization. So you can reduce the memory requirement for training. And I'm, I'm, I'm just wonder, you know, if you, if you apply LoRa technique after that. Mm. Is it a way to actually map the original parameters back to, to the previous state? And would that work? You know, potentially you can test the performance of the model uh, mm. with the new parameters as well. Yeah, so by default, uh, that's not happening. So by mm. default, the LoRa adapters are initialized such that they don't have any influence at all. So they are just mm. an identity transform on the model. Mm -hmm. And only when you train them uh, does that change. But uh, some of the options, so let's go back. So here, if you follow this link in the initialization schemes, some of the options that we have there, I think I also have the name. Um, so, for example, LoftQ would be one of these examples. It calculates basically the error that you get from quantizing, mm -hmm. and then it initializes the lower weights such that the error is minimized. Okay. So that means if you use this initialization scheme, you should get 
a model that works almost as well as the non-quantized variant. And then, of course, you can do additional training, and it should be even better. Okay, thank you. We have another question. Please go ahead. Um, thanks a lot for your talk. I have one question, and um, could you talk into the microphone a little yeah, bit more? Sorry. Uh, do you think that LoRa is a good method for the model to learn new knowledge? Because from my experience, it just learned new formatting. Um, yeah, new knowledge. It depends a little bit. So I think what what it's doing best is maybe like forcing a specific kind of knowledge that the model already has. Right? So these LLMs are very general, or other models can be very general and produce a bunch of different outputs, but you want a specific one. So as you mentioned, you want a specific format maybe. <laughs> then this will typically work really well. But if you check out the papers, I mean, I think it can be a bit debatable, like is it new knowledge or is it just the old knowledge repackaged? But they can at least solve tasks that were previously not really solvable with these LLMs. So I think there's a little bit of learning capacity since we have new parameters. But yeah, you should probably not expect a model that, for instance, has just been trained on English. You probably can't teach it uh, Czech. It's probably too much for Laura. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question over there. Yeah. Firstly, thanks for creating this library, and thank you for your talk as well. It's been really helpful to see exactly how much memory training some of these models will take. Mm. Um, I've already started a project fine-tuning using Axolotl, mm -hmm. and I was interested in your take on the different fine-tuning libraries available mm. and how they compare to each other. Um, yeah, so I had a slide on this, which ah. I put in the backup. So Axolotl is really excellent, so it for those who don't know it, it provides a bunch of streamlined fine-tuning scripts, basically. So if you want to get started, and for example, you don't want to experiment with all the hyperparameters and so on, you can check whether the task and the model you're interested in is already in Axolotl, and then you can uh, use that, and it builds on top of PEF, basically. So um, it, it's not quite as flexible because it's streamlined for those specific use cases, but if the use case fits for your problem, then you should definitely give it a try. And I think there's a similar library um, which you should definitely check out on the top here, which is Unsloth, which adds a bunch of optimizations on top, so you can get quicker results and even less memory. So you should also check that one out if it supports the use case that you're interested in. Perfect, thank you very much. Okay, I don't think there are any more questions. I would like to thank you once again. Can we give one big applause to...